this is an extremely, you know, sort of rich moment for me. That you see that these are posters from the first year, first two years of the Haven Center in the 1980s. 1986, Michael Mann came as one of our very early uh, visitors. Uh, in that same period, as you can see, Klaus Offa came, Stephen Loops came, Warren Terborn, very uh, exciting cast of characters in the came in the early years and still come to the Haven Center, but especially in those early years. You might also note that the dates of his, this was 1986, the dates of his lectures were spread out over four weeks, um, four successive Mondays. We used to have a program in which we would invite someone for three, sometimes four weeks, and uh, just schedule one lecture each week and then have lots of activities, study groups, meetings with students informally, seminars, you know, a, 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 a bigger set of things. That was in an era still at the tail, you know, the, the mid-80s was still the very tail end of the politicization period of the uh, late 60s and 70s. And there was a really vibrant population of grad students and undergraduates who would participate in those events. So then, then we hit this trough, which I think we're coming out of in the 90s and into the first part of the 2000s, I think there's more growing intensity for the kind of theoretical and academic engagements, not just with small scale and focused problems connected to social justice, but with the broader themes of social theory, ethical change, the dilemmas of our times, and the like. So it's uh, particularly nice when your, when uh, Michael Mann came in 1986, you were in the thick of probably writing volume two at that point? Or still yeah, one? it's the year of publication of volume one. Right, so you're, you're, yeah. you're busy working on volume two of the sources of social power, the, the great uh, work that spans most of your career. Uh, is it still, is there a volume five in the works or? Possibly. Possibly, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, you know, it would be one's fantasy to have a distinguished visitor come every 30 years. Uh, I don't know if either of us will still be even hobbling along 30 years from now, but um, it's really wonderful to have you back. Uh, let us all welcome Michael Mann. Thank you. It's uh, great to be back. Uh, thank you for the invitation, though I, I should also note that it came, it came 30 years after the first one. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm talking about the causes of war. Now, you, you'll notice that in the title here, I've added a word uh, on the causes of war, which would, be, would have been a more sensible title to give you, because it would sound just the causes of war that I'm going to give you a kind of complete theory of uh, the causes of war, whereas I'm giving you some reflections on uh, the causes of war, together with some suggestions. Now, where I start from is the model of the sources of social power. There are four sources of social power, four ways in which people can uh, get other people to do things which they w otherwise would not have done, and these four forms of power, uh, economic, ideological, military, and political. And I don't give any general weight to them. I think that their importance varies in different situations. Well, I'm now talking about war, and so obviously this is about military power. So it's important to stress that military power can bring desired resources. Not just economic resources, it can bring you whatever you want. Uh, it can, can bring you uh, uh, status, glory, sex, whatever. It is a generalized source of power. And because of this, wars are ubiquitous. That is, you find them everywhere in the world and in just about every uh, human society. But they are also costly. Uh, 
And in fact, peace is much more common than war. Though our sources uh, focus on wars, they still do. Turn on the television, and it's about wars which are exciting rather than peace, which is boring. And it's the same with the uh, with the early narratives, with the records that they record a great deal more war than they do peace. But that's very misleading. It's also written in the historical ones are written by the victors, overwhelmingly. And so we have the notion that both wars are common and successful. But actually most conflicts don't reach war. They're settled by diplomacy, or they remain sores without wars. Very important historically, two forms of diplomacy, the taking of hostages, or the exchange of hostages, come from a, one princely family to, uh, to another. Uh, the potential enemies, uh, uh, young sons or, or whatever, uh, live at the court of the, of the power that might have been the enemy. Or marriages, and dynastic diplomacy, is used as a settlement as well. One should note that the path to war is not straightforward because it involves interaction sequences between different human groups, between their leaders, uh, the particular war and peace parties that there might be, and I'll explain a little bit later what some of these are, and the soldiers themselves who will fight. And clearly, uh, the interaction process means that motivations for war uh, are likely to change through the process whereby war finally arrives. Now these are the main motivations, They're either declared to be the reason they're going to war by the people going to war, or they're what we infer, or what historians at the time inferred. But self-defense is, self is easily the most commonly uh, cited one by the people themselves. Uh, it's a universal cl claim, even by aggressors, I'll talk a bit later about justifications uh, that the Roman Republic gave. <coughs> then we have the economic motivations, and these are of two levels really. There is raiding, where you go in and come out again with valuable resources, uh, and there's conquest. And this might be for wealth, territory, slaves, whatever economic resources are there. But we have to raise the question why human groups choose war rather than two other possibilities, market economic power or coercing unequal, unequal terms of trade without actually going to war, threatening a lesser, uh, a, a group with lesser power but not actually going to war and signing a treaty which involves unequal powers as the as the Westerners, including the U.S., did with Japan uh, and, uh, and China at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Well, one might say that conquest gives you possession of territories, which is more secure, more certain, than our market, which are rather uncertain. But if we think about the, the Second War in Iraq, the U.S. chooses the path of conquest, but the Europeans, the Japanese, for some time had been choosing uh, market trade. You, you get the oil by paying for it at market prices. And that didn't seem to be a, a major problem for them. Uh, and indeed, since <laughs> the U.S. didn't really get much oil, it was not a kind of economically rational war from the point of view of economic resources. <coughs> there are the sexual motives, since war is uh, overwhelmingly a male activity, the reproduction of a human group uh, by taking the women, rape, concubine, marriages. 
which are often used by historical conquerors as a means of helping uh, to rule conquered countries by marrying their soldiers into local families. The uh, Romans did that extensively, so did the Persians, and so did the Mongols. <coughs> But in most wars, it's more a consequence than a cause. That is, soldiers take the opportunity provided by war to do these things. Uh, it wasn't the original motivation. And there are many ideological and emotional causes. There's ethnocentrism, intolerance, perhaps religious tolerance, that you have the true word of God and they don't. It might be excitement, adventurism, typically young men just seeking excitement, adventure. <coughs> and there's also a kind of sacred notion of sovereignty, that is, one must keep one's present sovereign territories. I'll come back to that. One must avenge a humiliation or an insult. There's the desire for status, honor, glory. And many of these develop into a culture of bellicosity, that war becomes uh, more a natural way of getting things uh, because it's been incorporated, uh, it's been, it's not just economic, it's glorious, it brings you status in your own community etc. And then there are political causes of which I've identified two main types. There are war parties, distinctive war parties, who favor war. Uh, younger sons and bastards who uh, in, in most historical societies, including modern imperialism, uh, it's the sons who cannot inherit, who are more willing to take the risk of war and the heads of the families are more likely to want to get rid of them anyway because they cause trouble at court because they're not going to inherit uh, this is younger sons or acknowledged bastards settlers people who want to settle american colonists uh, israelis today israeli settlers miners because uh, mining companies because uh, mineral resources are underground in specific territories, so it's a good idea to control those territories, that's the theory. <coughs> and soldiers themselves, of course. But then there are also political contexts. The experience with domestic repression uh, means you have organized an efficient military power, and so you're more likely to use it abroad. You might want to divert internal conflict. This is a, a kind of traditionally Marxian theory uh, that you avert class struggle by uh, going to war and bringing the classes together. Uh, this is important, perhaps, in the courses of World War I. And then there's scapegoating uh, other groups. And then finally, there's the causes stressed by uh, IR, international relations, geopolitical causes, seizing strategic places, obtaining geopolitical dominance, and aid to allies, which is a kind of offensive defense. Uh, Rome, the Roman Republic, typically went to war with another group, ostensibly in support of it, one of its allies, who'd been threatened by another group. And this was a kind of systematic process of so one has to conclude it wasn't genuinely defense, uh, it was offensive defense, defense of one's, one's allies in order to acquire more territory. And you might want to preempt others' expansion, which is what was going on in the scramble for Africa at the end of the 19th century, uh, that you seized places that might be completely worthless, but it's better that you get them rather than the French get them or whatever. So these motivations are so varied and complex 
that it's unlikely that you'll get an, uh, an easy theory of them. <coughs> Current explanations, well, historians stress, and they're right to stress, the sequencing of wars. I'll come back to this. That is, the wars are not independent cases. They have a history, and that history influences present war or peace. <coughs> But obviously, historians don't provide much in the way of theory. Now, international relations theory uh, builds on uh, something that was known before, uh, which is that geopolitics is lawless. That is, whereas within states and communities, there is some kind of rule of law. But the international space is not covered by any law. And so anything is possible, including unprovoked aggression. And this has been uh, linked with the Hobbesian notion of anarchy and develops the notion of security dilemmas, which is uh, I build up my military force thinking that I'm threatened. That forces you to build up your military force uh, etc. and there's an arms race, a race of threats, etc. and that is the security dilemma. Do I respond to someone uh, expanding their military power by building my own up or not? An IR person called Vent has uh, argued, however, that Hobbesian geopolitics is not the only form of geopolitics. There are Lockean and Kantian and their forms of anarchy uh, rarely generate wars. So this is not a complete explanation. And unfortunately for international relations, there's no agreement between them on what kinds of geopolitical systems generate war. Some people say that power predominance, that is, I have much more power than you, and so I'll make war against you, that that's more likely to generate war than a situation of equality of states or near equality. But there are others who argue the reverse. What's the relationship between, between trade and war? Well, a traditional liberal view is more trade brings less war. But many have pointed out that that's not the case and that more trade uh, often brings more war. <coughs> There's the problem of hegemony, hegemony which is supposed to bring peace. Well, Chinese empire, yes, but the US, no. The US is the hegemon, but makes war, etc. There is the correlation with democracy, supposed, you know, either democracies don't make war, or the weaker version is democracies don't make war with other democracies, but that you can only arrive at that by excluding all the colonial cases where kind of you know, the, the tribal and clan groups of uh, natives uh, have their forms of democracy, direct democracy as well. I mean, you know, typical uh, Native American tribe, uh, some war leader wanted to go to war and you had a perfectly free choice as to whether you would follow him or not. And of course, the United States, a democracy, made war uh, with them. And so the correlation disappears. Now, the main statistics are provided by the Correlates of War Project, uh, COW. There are other statistics, but of course, they can only look at war since 1816. They severely undercount colonial wars. Uh, because their method traditionally was you need a thousand battlefield deaths. Well, in the colonial wars, the, co uh, the colonial power doesn't often incur a thousand battlefield deaths. Uh, the natives probably do, but nobody counted them. So, uh, there's this big problem with, with, with the, the data. But of course the data does tend to exaggerate when interpreted in certain ways, exaggerate the frequency of war. 
most striking one I've come across is the assertion that humanity has only been at peace for 8%, 8% of all years over the last 3,000 to 4,000 years. My God, human beings are ferocious. But no, that what that means is somewhere in the world a war is being fought in almost every year. But most places are, of course, at peace. And we have modern versions of that today. Uh, you know, our notion of Africa wars. But of course, most African countries do not see wars. But again, it's the excitement of war versus the boringness of peace. <coughs> and the final problem is that all wars are counted as one and autonomous. That is, you, know, you seek the causes of these wars without reference to other wars, prior wars, or wars elsewhere. Uh, they, uh, you can deal with the problem that World War II is counted as one war, and so is the, uh, um, and, and so is the, uh, the, the U.S. and Allies invasion of Iraq in the first uh, Iraq war. Uh, but you can deal with that by talking of, uh, by analyzing the number of deaths and things like that. There is a kind of consensus about a couple of uh, empirical observations. The first war is between neighbors, except for naval imperialism. So the Greeks, the Phoenicians, and then the Romans were able to make war on people who weren't their neighbors because they had control of the Mediterranean. And in modern times, the European and then American and Japanese uh, empires uh, made war on people who were not their neighbors. But the fact that they, you do make war on your neighbors means that a theory advanced by Faber is not correct. That is, the wars are between or against people seen as aliens part of his stress on ethnocentrism, uh, aliens. Your neighbors are very rarely seen as aliens, but they're perhaps seen more as threats, but not uh, of a different species of humanity. And I've argued about things like the First World War, that hostile ethno-nationalism was more a consequence of the war than a cause of it. And the second thing in which there is obvious agreement is that disputes over border sovereignty predominate. Who controls the border between two communities? I'm often saying communities rather than states because I don't want to confine it to, to states. I mean, there are non-state uh, militias and there are also human communities without states that make war. Finally, the whole literature is too social. I mean, it might be an odd for a sociologist to say that, but there is a neglect of ecology. What kinds of ecologies favor what kinds of war? The most obvious one is naval versus land uh, conquest. Okay, well, there's a kind of core model which uh, is advanced which blends economic and military power and it makes a great deal of sense or at least it's highly plausible war is a rational calculation by a community weighing up economic gain or oh, sorry perceived economic gain against perceived military costs both in money and in lives, plus the chances of victory. Because if you, if you, it wouldn't be rational to go to war against a group that you perceive as more powerful than yourself. Or to, uh, yes. Now there are there's some obvious problems that IR people have dealt with here, uh, which is the downward spiral towards war 
and uncertainties about what your allies will do, whether they will actually fight with you or not, makes calculation more difficult. It also makes backing down, in quotes, more difficult, which is seen as a sign of weakness. And there can be a sense of inevitability sweeping the powers along, as happened in the First World War. But there is a, a more persistent problem, which is a tendency to exaggerate your own strength. That is, in most cases, the rival combatants go to war expecting that they will win. And that is implied in <coughs> that runs against the rational calculation. In World War I, the five major powers all expected victory. That's Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, Britain, France. But obviously, someone had to lose. And in this case, at least three of them lost, in fact lost everything. That is, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia lost their empires, lost their emperors. And, uh, and they were the ones that first provoked the war, first went to war. So why this persistent <coughs> exaggeration and miscalculation? Well, <coughs> IR people say it's miscommunication and you can, uh, you can do some analysis of that. But of course it is amplified by ideology. That is, you're more likely to go to war if you believe that you have the one true faith, and they don't. And it's persistently the case that authoritarian regimes uh, understate the military capability of democracies. Right? World War I, Germans didn't think that Britain and Fra France uh, could fight as effectively as they could. Uh, they were right, actually, but since the, the Allies, as the name suggested, have had more uh, of them than, uh, uh, than Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, the outcome was different. <coughs> and we find it also in the ancient world, so that, uh, to begin with, uh, city-states under tyrannical rule, under single person rule, uh, underestimated the military capacity of Rome, which was a republic. A republic of, for the ancient world, it was a democracy. So there's a major puzzle. Why do weaker states fight rather than submit or compromise? Of course, some do. Uh, but as various people have historians have pointed out, uh, it takes at least two to make a war, and so it isn't only, a, a, in certain contexts, a really aggressive power that makes war, it's the other power that decides to resist. So, <coughs> why do they fight? And I've given here three possible, uh, three, uh, uh, three things which uh, are sometimes at work. The first is, as I said earlier, that sovereignty is sacred. Countries will not give up sovereignty. <coughs> and you fight against the odds to retain it. Right. Modern case of this, uh, the Falklands or Malvinas Wars between Britain and Argentina, where British people didn't even know that they possessed the Falkland Isles. Uh, they're right off Argentina, so it would be logical for Argentina to rule them, uh, rather than have ships sailing uh, right across the world to give supplies to the small population. And uh, also, uh, it's difficult to sail that far and fight a war against the locals, against the local power. But, 
course, it turned out well for Britain in the end. An amazing commitment to military resources. Because the Falkland Isles were British, period. And that uh, was enough to fight a war. There's the fear of status and honour, not backing down. Because you lose credibility. And uh, you lose credibility, especially among your own people. It's a way that, that leaders can fall by backing down. Of course, if they lose, they're even more likely to be uh, overturned. And after the war starts, elites of lesser powers are fighting for their own personal survival. And this is the case, for example, the Mongol Empire. They marched on a city. They gave the inhabitants the choice of surrender or death. And uh, the elites in the city know that they don't have the choice, that if they surrender, they get put to the sword. And so they fight on the hope that they and fight off the Mongols and personally survive. So the conclusion of this is that economic and military rationality is not sufficient on its own. You've got to add in uh, ideological and political causes. Now, one of the striking things about the pattern of warfare it's how the differences between different regions and different periods of history are so striking. That is, there are some uh, communities, civilizations, that are almost perpetually at war, and there are others that are rarely at war. And this can go over large regions. And I've taken five case studies now, according to the Emperor of Augustus, the Temple of Janus in Rome was only closed for three years in the whole history of Rome over 400 years. And what that meant is Rome was at peace in those three years, but at war in the over 400 other years. Now, again, that, that's... You know, you've got to be careful with that, but what that means is the Roman Republic and then the, well, yeah, the Roman Republic, because Augustus is the very first empire, he's only talking about the Republic. Um, Rome isn't at, the Roman Republic isn't at war everywhere, it's just at war somewhere. But sending the legions out, and these are quite important wars. <coughs> Western Europe between the medieval and modern period. In fact, right up to 1945, Western Europe made most of the wars, of the recorded wars of the world in that period. The statistic is sometimes presented that in Europe there was 1.1 war per year. Well, again, most of Europe would have been at peace, but there was a war somewhere every year, on average. <coughs> and what we know from the Correlates of War project, the cow data, is that in the period post-1816, Europeans uh, contributed 70% uh, of the wars, but I think that has to be increased to 80% because of their miscalculating their uh, colonial wars. In fact, uh, a Dutch uh, historian called Wesseling has uh, shown that in the period from 1870 to 1914, the colonial powers, on average, fought each one, fought about 2.5 wars per year. That's in, that is in, in, impressive warrior spirit. Now, in contrast to those cases, we get Latin America. 
after the wars of independence, where there are virtually no wars. There's only one really large-scale war, a couple of minor ones and a few skirmishes, but essentially a continent of peace. And then there's variations within a community. In Japan, the Edo period, or the Tokugawa period, uh, was very peaceful, almost no wars. The Meiji Restoration, however, from the 1880s to 1945, was extremely war <coughs> Japan made a very sudden transition from peace to war. And all these stereotypes of Japanese samurai traditions and uh, all of that um, isn't how it happened at all. They had to recapture uh, 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 armed forces. Uh, also, uh, to begin with, they treated their uh, captives well. Uh, when they fought against Russia in 1905, they treated uh, Russian casualties uh, very well, and the Russians did the same with them. Uh, by World War II, it had changed so that they behaved atrociously towards uh, prisoners, murderously. So again, there's a rather, then there's a rather more sudden transformation. Or why? And then finally, China, which has been in this very long period called the Spring and More Autumn period, followed by the Warring States period from 772 BC to 221 BC. I put down here that, that there were 1.3 wars a year. Uh, someone else has recently estimated 1.6 wars a year. Again, somewhere in China, in this northern Chinese uh, state system. <coughs> but then, when China is unified under the uh, um, Han Dynasty, uh, well, the Qin Dynasty to begin, uh, uh, it became steadily more Pacific. And the last two dynasties fought barely any wars, except wars of self-defense uh, against barbarian incursions. And this is the period of Chinese hegemony, when they dominated East and South Europe, uh, sorry, Asia, Eastern and Southern Asia, uh, but did it without war. Obviously, it was a threat of Chinese military power in the background, but it's uh, different. <coughs> so there are these cases of rare warfare. The Ming and Qing, uh, Qing dynasties in China, Edo, Japan, post-colonial Latin America. And these, you know, I've picked cases which are relatively well documented. I mean, who knows how many other civilizations would have been on one or the other pole? Well, we can assume that similar disputes bring war or peace in different periods and different places. Why? Well, I'm still doing research on this, so I'm not going to pretend that I've got a complete explanation, but I've got some preliminary conclusions. What follows from what I said earlier is that war results where both sides perceive their military superiority or where one or both of them defend sovereignty or their own lives. Well, exaggerating their own strength is already really uh, uh, implicit in, in uh, military superiority. Uh, well, <laughs> that gives some, uh, uh, some cop-outs, right? And it doesn't give you a simple predictive power of the war. Now, as far as hegemony is concerned, genuine hegemons, uh, Ming China and Edo Tokugawa Japan, reduce, do reduce war. 
But partial hegemons, like the Roman Republic or the United States, do so in some regions, but increase it in others. So obviously, the US has been hegemonic over Europe for some time, uh, since World War II. Uh, after fighting wars in Asia, it became the hegemon in East Asia too, in China of course. Uh, but it's had persistent, it had persistent problems in imposing its power on Latin America and persistent problems in the Middle East and obviously these now weren't very large. So, but of course that tends towards circularity, that distinction. But then I think come the two more important ones. Uh, the first is what I call political ecology. Uh, and this is where you have uh, the ability to deflect war onto weaker parties. And it's normally uh, uh, found on the edges of multi-state systems, where two states will begin to fight each other, two major powers, let's call them, uh, begin to fight each other, uh, but then they can displace this onto weaker people. Uh, Western Europe is the, is the major example of this in three phases. First of all, the revival of Western Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire takes place in the kind of Frankish core, that is the Franks, the Normans, people like them. And what they do is expand outwards uh, into the less powerful uh, whether are less powerful states or no states at all, and they're able to make gains relatively easily. The second phase is when Europe now becomes filled up with states. Uh, before, it was only the Frankish core that really had states in the modern sense. Second phase, Europe is filled up. And so now the big states attack the little states. And the big states might be nominally fighting against each other, but what, what the outcome is, is that they can gobble up the allies of the other one, the small allies. And then the third phase is just when Europe seems to be uh, largely dominated by big states, uh, there is the possibility of naval imperialism. They go across the world so that, for example, Britain and France do fight wars, they also fight them in the rest of the world and the major territorial shifts are there and that the, uh, the losses involved in war between Britain and France are not great. They can deflect it elsewhere. This was also noticeably the case in uh, ancient China, uh, where there are what the Chinese call barbarians uh, on their fringes, and there's a persistent gobbling up of them, and there are fights between the Chinese states which get deflected onto the minor ones. So in these cases, you have a kind of uh, shift towards that uh, uh, economic military calculation because it's not clear why these states would fight each other without incurring great losses. Uh, but if they can deflect it onto the barbarians and gobble up their territories, uh, then it is more economically, militarily rational. <coughs> Latin America is different. After the wars of independence, there are various independent Latin American states. Now, though their borders were not in reality clear, because there's a lot of jungles and mountains involved, uh, in principle, they were. Because either they, in each state, either inherited a Bourbon, a Spanish uh, province, or they inherited a treasury district, a caja of the Spanish Empire. And so their boundaries were clear to each other. 
Now they could have fought border wars and there were one or two skirmishes, but the logistics were very much against sending an army from the heartland uh, to the periphery uh, and to fight a war there, uh, and the gains might not be very much. <coughs> but their deflectionism was within each state. That is, that ambitious newcomers, younger sons, bastards, etc., or indeed existing settlers, could make their uh, way by exterminating natives, fighting the uh, native population, the indigenous population of Latin America. So there, the warfare is deflected onto uh, internal enemies and not onto external big exception is the war between uh, Paraguay, uh, Argentina, and Brazil, and there's Uruguay probably as well. Uh, someone made a suggestion of it. Chile. Really? The war of the Pacific. Oh yeah, that's different. Yes, I'm talking now about the, um, the war, what's it called, with the Paraguayan dictator, Lopez War, which has very large losses very large number of people killed. And that's about control of the Rio Plateau. It's a valuable resource, a very valuable resource. There is the war of the Pacific, which uh, hots up once they discover the mineral deposits there. Uh, uh, but the, that's all really. There are one or two skirmishes elsewhere, but uh, almost nothing. And the, uh, but there are, of course, internal wars. Uh, dispossessing the Native uh, Americans. But when they are dispossessed, there's no tradition of fighting other states, and the wars decline into zero between states, and there are no longer states, uh, uh, there are no longer wars against the Native Americans. <coughs> And the second ecological feature uh, is uh, that a strong defensive ecology aids aggression. So, Chin China, which is one of the last surviving Chinese states, you know, the 150 Chinese states go down to 50, go down to, goes really down to seven, and Chin is one of those. Uh, and it is located in a, defense, uh, in a uh, defensively secure position of mountains uh, and it has the opportunity of expanding still outwards uh, among barbarians and so increasing its resources. And it's this combination that enables Chile to defeat the others uh, and, uh, uh, and have the first unified empire of China. Now, there are obviously other ecological factors as well, and I think that uh, they can be explored and should be explored. Terrain matters, especially to battles, of course, the number of battles where, uh, where generals have uh, uh, miscalculated what be, would be needed in this particular terrain is very large. <coughs> and finally, path dependency. This is simple to understand and perhaps not unexpected. If you have repeated victories, you carry on doing. It brings more aggression, more aggressive confidence. The fusing of political and military institutions. Annabellico's culture, and Rome is the outstanding example of this, where it fights uh, wars almost continuously, doesn't win them all, but wins most of them. <coughs> uh, and uh, its own culture becomes highly bellicose. Uh, the political system uh, shifts. Uh, senators, it's always been a, a Senate and a popular Congress uh, running it, especially the Senate. But the, the senators, uh, in order to advance their political careers, have to become generals and bring back uh, victories uh, and the desirable thing is to bring back a triumph, you know, the marching, the 
defeated through the streets of Rome together with all the wealth that you seized. <coughs> and this saw Rome change from, in the very first place, to fight, fighting defensive wars uh, to fighting this offensive defense uh, where you, um, uh, you use allies as an excuse to fight uh, to cases where it's just pure aggression as it was against in the Punic Wars against the Carthaginians, where Rome simply provoked uh, the, uh, the Punic Wars and the Carthaginians uh, defended themselves. So this is a kind of amplifying process whereby victory is <coughs> obvious enough, of course. Uh, whereas, of course, the sequence of defeats and devastation bring more pacifism. And uh, Roman defeats in the first century uh, 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 AD uh, and the very last years of the first century BC uh, brought a more defensive uh, stance. Uh, defeats against the German barbarians and the Parthians, the Persians. So that a kind of sequence of, uh, of victories or defeats can be shifted by a great shock uh, to the system, as happened with the Japanese. That is, from being isolated for, for uh, many years, letting in the kind of Dutch in a very peripheral way, uh, they were suddenly confronted by Commodore Perry's fleet and by the, uh, the visible sight that China was being humiliated by all of the Western powers. And so the Japanese fought what was a kind of offensive defensive war. <laughs> that is, it was self-defense. They thought, we're not going to survive unless we take a different route to China and build up our economic military capacity. Uh, and then, of course, it, uh, success at that uh, brings a more general uh, militarism. <coughs> so, uh, there's no grand conclusion, I'm afraid. Uh, all four of the power sources are involved, but war is, in the final instance, it's consequent <coughs> on contingent decisions, on battlefield decisions. Uh, are often somewhat contingent, accidental, or the result of incompetence. Uh, I'll be talking uh, uh, next week about... Tomorrow. Uh, sorry, not next week. Tomorrow. <laughs> uh, about trends of war, both long-term and short-term, so I'll be talking much more about the period from 1945 than I have today. Thank you. Your presentation doesn't really make any emphasis whatsoever on technology. Um, I mean, you could argue, for example, that uh, the ability to make war or project power is based on, to a certain extent, on technology. If you're a Latin American state, you're surrounded by mountains, you would have a, a leadership that's land-based military. Um, you can argue that those are all factors which may have limited uh, the ability of those states to conflict with each other. Similarly, you've got um, the Vikings who uh, developed uh, a light, capable ship, uh, which is certainly an effective vehicle for trade, but also as an effective vehicle for war. Um, the Vikings could go through the Russian river system down to Istanbul, into the Mediterranean. Um, and I, I don't know where you, you fit these various and sundry technological advances, uh, which in some ways enable a 
projection of power or enable the ability to make more into your, into your process? Uh, well, uh, the first point to make is that, uh, as I'll make clear tomorrow, technology matters a great deal in the contemporary era. Not only nuclear weapons, but other things too. Uh, but I'll leave that for tomorrow. In general, uh, technology uh, is, I mean, you, the Viking ships is an example, yes. Uh, but then others react to that and they develop uh, systems of, of defense against that. Uh, and all the time, the history of warfare, it doesn't matter whether, you know, what weapons we're dealing with, um, if a power develops uh, some new form of fighting, uh, and very often it's not technological, it's social, it's a particular kind of formation, uh, then the others around um, kind of adapted, you know. I mean, the, the Romans um, uh, faced with Carth Carthaginian naval power uh, in a year built uh, a number of the employed Greek technicians <laughs> to build another, a number of naval galleys, which meant they could uh, almost equal the Carthaginians at sea. And, uh, you know, this is, this is typical uh, of, of it. So the technological superiority tends to be temporary and also I think is less important than the social. So the, Roman, the, the way the Romans developed their legion from the Greek phalanx, the Greek phalanx is where the infantry are solid together. Each man's shield protects half of himself and half of the next person. So they're really dependent on each other. It's something a tremendous force for solidarity. But the Romans devised uh, a different system whereby uh, they left a little space between each person in the front rank, uh, meaning that the second rank could come forward and displace it, and the third rank the same and everything, and that proved uh, to be great. And so, I mean, Greeks <laughs> imitated that. Uh, first of all, I should say, the Romans uh, adapted the Greek phalanx formation, but then moved on to something else. And, um, of course, in the modern period, uh, early modern period, gunpowder was not a European invention. Cannonry was not a European invention. There were three empires, which, uh, Asian empires, which had uh, cannons. The Europeans uh, learnt from them and devised better cannons, especially on ships. So, it's... Uh, uh, and the superiority of, uh, in the 20th century of German armies over uh, had to send twice as many soldiers against them as they had uh, was about social organization and having a very low officer, officer to other ranks uh, ratio uh, and a very low staff to, to battlefield uh, uh, manpower. So, uh, the, the, Low-level officers were able uh, to uh, take independent decisions on their own um, and other aspects of their organization. But it, it's typically that kind of thing that brings military superiority, I think. Um, the contemporary one has changed fundamentally the nature of warfare rather than giving advantage to one particular because after all, when the Americans developed nuclear weapons, the, the Soviets promptly did so, and others have been doing it ever since. Yes. Now, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And I was particularly <coughs> taken with your emphasis on political ecology. And I'd like to pursue that in a yeah. slightly odd way, perhaps. In considering the political ecology of this issue, we have to consider the very existence of the state itself as perhaps the ultimate cause of war. And what leads me to the question or observation of the remarks of the historian of Africa, John Lonsdale, who once said that, or who once wrote that, um, this is not an exact quotation, but it's close, uh, he once wrote that um, one of the greatest contributions of Africa to human civilization is the art was the art of living peacefully together, not in states. 
So if one goes back to pre-colonial Africa, there are, in fact, historical models for peaceful living. Now, there were other things involved, too. Uh, low population, extensive land, which diffused a great many conflicts that otherwise might have occurred. But it seems to me the very form and the shell of the state is perhaps what is what we ought to be looking at. And I think the example of Latin America you bring up it also runs in very much the same direction. Those states are, for the most part, other than Central America, so large that they can deflect it, deflect it within, uh, rather than outward. Mm. Well, uh, the argument that the uh, the emergence of the state in human history uh, uh, in increased warfare is quite generally accepted. It's not accepted by everyone. Uh, there is a group of people who argue that uh, wars among hunter-gatherers were <laughs> much more deadly uh, than later wars. But I, I share the view that you <coughs> put forward that the origins of the state uh, do bring more war, they certainly bring more organized war, uh, and more deadly war, I think. Uh, uh, but once it's invented, the state, then it doesn't give you all that much predictive power about what's, uh, about the development of warfare. No, but it, it does suggest uh, perhaps a solution to the problem. Here. No, I see the anarchist solution. Yeah. Um, the, uh, your remarks about Africa uh, are controversial. There are revisionists around who say that there's a hell of a lot of fighting going on uh, among uh, clan and tribal groups. Uh, did the Zulus have a state? Yes, they did. They did, okay. I mean, there were states in yeah. sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. There were every bit as much uh, states, as, as states as we know them yeah. uh, today. But the point is they weren't fixed in time and they weren't given an artificial life through the vehicle of recognition of international sovereignty. Mm. Yeah. Well, the trouble is the evidence. Uh, I had uh, started with the same view of Africa that you have, and then I read a few studies of uh, Sudan and other places where there was a big stress on warfare between uh, different groups. But of course you don't have quantitative data, you don't have uh, you know, very systematic data, and so uh, we don't ultimately know, I think. And that's true about hunter-gatherers, you know. Archaeologists haven't found any incident, uh, any indication of violence uh, leading to death uh, before um, before 12,000 BC. Obviously, from 12 to 8,000 is pre state, and they have found uh, remains of skeletons with you know, holes in their head caused by an axe and things. <coughs> so, who knows? Yeah. So, um, you mentioned that the Zulus were is your image of war interstate war? And does the, the theories that you presented apply to civil war? And if not, why not? Or what's what's different about civil war than interstate war? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> and civil wars are rather different. Uh, have I incorporated it into this uh, paper? No. And uh, I, tomorrow I will note the importance which you know, no one can not notice about the importance of civil wars in the last two decades. Um, well, it's... Um, it's obviously got differences. I don't buy uh, the new wars series. I think there are some new features, but not nearly as many as uh, Caldo and others have argued. 
I think there is uh, civil wars historically as well uh, are often more deadly than interstate wars with fewer rules. And so this is a, a big dent in the notion that uh, it's only international space that is enormous. It's when states break down uh, that you also get uh, deadly wars in which there's a great deal of devastation and death. And I will, I'll talk a little bit <coughs> more about it uh, tomorrow, but the honest answer is no. <laughs> Yes. You said that you don't have a grand theory of war to tie it all together, but I wonder if perhaps you do after all. Um, oh. you, you say that uh, war is a consequence of contingent decisions by all, and I think it follows from what you've argued in the sources of social power, the four volumes, and then what you've extended here, that those contingencies vary systematically based on the other three sources of social power, the political, the economic, and the ideological. And all of your examples follow, you know, it can be explained in those terms. So why doesn't that suffice as um, the general theory of war? That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the kind of theory I develop, you're quite right. <laughs> but I myself tend to think of that as a little bit of a cop-out. Cop -out. I'd like to be able to go further. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, um, it does enable you to say under what conditions would you be surprised the war would occur? Yes. And under yes. what conditions would you not be surprised? Right. And that's getting pretty far along on what makes a theory. A yes. Theory. Yes. Sure. But there, there are contingencies in terms of <laughs> the outcomes of war is is also important, uh, and the. Um, uh, and the, the battlefield contingencies, the incompetences, uh, and they're also manifested in the drift towards war. Of, uh, the groups grossly overestimating their own power, military power. So that's the case where I've tended, uh, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I tend to have ideological emotional as a kind of residual category. Uh, but I think that straightforward, well, the mistakes normally come from arrogance. You know, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, the Roman defeats. Uh, I'm thinking that there's an arrogance about uh, Roman power, and so you, you, you march your um, legions across a almost desert plain and the enemy horse archers uh, run rings around you and, and pick you off one by one as it were and uh, the other one they against the, the Germans in the wood uh, where they advance through this dense wood and they can't fight in formation there and so the Germans are, are better at kind of hand-to-hand -hand encounters where they not much organization is required. Now these are cases of contingency that, that are different to those that you mentioned, but I think, yes, I must think about that more. Thank you. Yeah. It, one of the, 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 the things that's kind of bounced around in my mind um, is, is our overall approach to the problem incorrect in the sense that perhaps rather than looking at it from a Newtonian approach that perhaps we need to look at it from more of a, a quantum approach. Um, I was struck in reading in, in, in chaos theory and how often um, it seemed to make sense, but otherwise didn't make sense. Essentially, uh, you're sitting down and saying that um, we can only predict probabilities. Uh, there are no absolutes that uh, 
that all a decision maker can really do is try to maximize the probability of success and minimize the problems of, of failure, but that um, that the kind of idea that there is some overall grand theory that says Eureka, this is it. Uh, we can nail it down in a nice Newtonian format, and you know, A plus B equals C. Uh, I, I, the human error reaction is so complicated, and we throw all the factors into it. Uh, I don't know that there's any way you can sit down and, and try to explain it. Uh, well. Let me give you the example of my interpretation of the Russian Revolution, of the Bolshevik Revolution. That you've got a, a kind of logic of the development of late capitalism, a series of uh, you know, Russia had bigger factories, uh, more concentrated proletariat, uh, an authoritarian state which gave workers no rights, and you had, therefore, a build-up of class consciousness and a build-up of, of practical Marxism among the working class. That's one cause of shame. But I think that would have led to a failed revolution, as it did in other countries. The second chain is the chain of geopolitics, of Russia fighting a war in which uh, it was just not a match for the Germans, and led to devastation in Russia and the failure to bring food to the cities and everything like that. Now, the, this is a conjunction between them. There's no connection between them, because I don't buy the argument that the Russians fight the war in order to um, avoid class conflict. Um, uh, the two separate chains, they come together contingently, and then you have an outcome. And I think that's the kind of model that I want to uh, develop further. It's not, it's not chaos, but there are chaos, <laughs> chaos of course, or battles, as Tolstoy remarked, you know, once the cannon fire, there's fog over the battlefield, and no one can see what's going on. Uh, but uh, it's the, the uncertainty and the accidental quality, it, it comes from this conjunction of different chains each with their logic. So I didn't say anything about the logic of geopolitics, uh, but it's about uh, um, the, uh, the Russian attempt to enormously modernize its armed forces, German alarm at that, German, Germany attacks them before they're finally ready. War is supposed to be what uh, Tsarist regime is good at. Uh, they fight, but they're not good enough. So, uh, you know, I think that we, we do have to cope with what you're, what you're saying, uh, chaos and contingency, but maybe we can say a bit more. Um, I had a question about uh, your definitions and the boundaries of war. So you mentioned that the, the COW projects sets a threshold of a thousand deaths that seems kind of arbitrary to me, and maybe it's not. Maybe there's a reason that that counts as a war. And I was just wondering, if, and also you mentioned how you know most conflicts are resolved peacefully. They're resolved through negotiation and, and diplomacy. Um, is, the, is this a theory of conflict? Uh, is there a point at which a conflict becomes a war and there's discontinuity in what the theory explains because of something that happens? Have you, you know, looked closely at where that is, or? This is a more general thing that only you only see on the upper end of the, the uh, continuum. I mean, how, how do you address that? Yeah, first of all, I should uh, uh, qualify what I said about the cow data. That's how they started 1,000 battle day. But other people have brought that down to see what happens when you do bring it down. But unfortunately, they can't count a lot of the kind of wars of the world. Right? Um, Yeah, so the essential point, other point that you made is what? Well, uh, just where 
I guess where you where you draw the lines of what is a war and yeah. what isn't a war and yeah. where the, the patterns that you've identified start to apply or whether they apply across the entire perspective. Well, one can't <laughs> draw lines uh, about uh, wars. I'm looking at the kind of cases which everybody would agree were wars. <laughs> Uh, uh, under what circumstances do they get resolved and what not? Well, I think that some of that is implicit in what I've been saying, but, but not everything. And I think that We don't have enough evidence on cases where it didn't happen. <laughs> this is you know, the excitement of war. Uh, I think a particularly interesting example, however, is the, the First World War, which has you know, many causes. But once things have declined to a certain, once relations have declined to a certain extent, uh, nobody can back down the status of themselves and of their country would be undermined by that. And so, you know, I, I use the metaphor, it's like little boys fighting in the playground, you know. Um, there's, uh, there's often nothing in dispute, uh, nothing substantial in dispute, uh, but you can't back down. Uh, but they do sometimes. So I can't really answer your okay. question. No, fair enough. Yeah. Um, uh, do you see any value in the explanation that uh, internal conflicts lead to external conflicts or war? In a sense, external relational internal conflicts, which are also related to the revolution. Which are also? Related to the occurrence of revolution. Right. Um, well, in some worlds, yes, but I think uh, most worlds, no. Uh, that is, if you take the example again of the First World War, that argument has often been developed. That is, the First World War breaks out because the reactionary regimes um, want uh, to deflect class consciousness. Russia especially, Austria, Hungary, Germany. And uh, the argument has often been made, but if, if you look at what the people were saying at the time, there were more people saying we shouldn't put the uh, we shouldn't put rifles in the hands of the working class. Uh, war is too dangerous in the present uh, uh, level of development of economic development. Um, and I think, you know, the argument doesn't really work there. Uh, the, uh, it, it's true in a peculiar sense in, in the British case, where there's a liberal government uh, who, if they declare war, half the cabinet will resign because there's a strong pacifist wing in the, the Liberal Party, and that will let in the Conservatives. Um, and so the Liberals will lose power. And so they can't, they can't warn Germany, they can't say, if you invade Belgium, you're at war with us, which was what they were thinking in, in, in private, but the Germans didn't realize this, and they thought the British wouldn't fight. So in that case, they are deflecting a kind of internal conflict, uh, but it's, towards not making war, or not taking the steps necessary to avert war. Uh, you want to well, the first your thought, can I have it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. Um, what people, what uh, sinologists say about early Chinese wars is that the masses weren't involved. 
they didn't give a didn't give a toss which state they belonged to. And it was entirely a thing of elites. But elites developed ways of coercing peasants into fighting in their armies. So I think it depends very much on the, the nature of class relations or ethnic relations. Uh, I can't, there probably are examples of averting ethnic conflict, but I, no, I don't know. So, didn't do the Turks any good. It didn't do the Armenians any good, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, I had two thoughts in light of some of the threads that have been going on here. One is this issue of the relationship between a kind of systematic causal chain type of theory and a contingent and the contingent concatenation of them. That's a common feature of all sorts of explanations, mm. including in the natural sciences. Mm. So if you want to explain why any given person gets cancer, we have a general view that smoking causes cancer. But of course that's contingent because most people who smoke don't get cancer. It, what it actually is is a claim about a particular causal chain that contingently intersects some other causal chains, which may or may not be well understood, then you have a black box, or may be well understood. So I, I think that kind of explanation has good standing as, you know, full bore theoretical explanation. If you can get it to the point where you can specify a set of causal yeah. chains, yeah. so it's not just any old damn one thing after another, you, yes. and that's yes. what you're doing. You have a a you know, well-ordered set of causal chains, and then they're contingent interconnection. Um, yes. The second thing that struck me is that some of the arguments you make apply to playground squabbles between kids, and some don't. So what's in play here is something about motivation at the level of individuals in the simplest sense. Uh, so it would explain all sorts of violence. So the, the, there's a broader category of phenomena of violence between people, um, of which war is a very special type of mm. violence. And some of your mechanisms apply to almost every kind of violence one can imagine, and some don't. Um, and in your IEMP, the I part is the one, certainly one of, well, and the, and the resources one. Those two seem to go all the way down to the micro level. You can people steal things, they mug people for economic resources. So you use violence to gain economic resources. And you can use economic resources to force, to buy the weapons to mug people, etc. I mean... Or steal their lunch money. And steal their lunch money. <laughs> the political ones, by the nature of political power, seem to be... The military one is just the use of you have violent capacity to coerce people, but the, the political ones seem to want, the ones that are kind of most distinctive. Ironically, it's not the military ones that are most distinctive in the violence of war, but the political ones, in a way, because that's the only one of your four that I think is unique to states, right? I mean, or quasi, or state-like entities. You can't, individuals don't have rule-enforcing capacity over territory or whatever, you know, they, the kind of administrative and infrastructural power stuff that's the stuff of political power. Oh, is Al Capone? Yeah, okay. Well, maybe. So maybe gang, you know, but I, there's something about war that has this political dimension that really differentiates it from lots of other kinds of violence. Yes, it's, it's legitimate. It's legit, not, it's legitimized not, violence. No, not in, not in, um, in the, the, Michael's. Legitimate. Not in Michael's view of legitimized. Uh, no, legitimized. That's not my. That's not Nick's uh, definition of political power. That's Davis. So you, he has a, you know, a different. Uh, well, I kind of. Uh, well, I, I disagree. I mean, first of all, most people who uh, smoke for a long time do get lung cancer. <laughs> they get some illness, not necessarily. Well, no, you're right. You get heart disease and right, things right. like that, no, which I'm just are saying generated right. by... Okay, okay. <laughs> that, that was my point. The specificity yeah. of getting that ailment yeah, okay, okay. is contingent. Um, well, I think uh, 
in a way, the political factor which matters most is the opposite of what you're saying. It's when you get uh, um, an individual or a small group in charge of the community of the state <coughs> and wanting to make war. And uh, their political power means that they can uh, commit uh, much of the population <coughs> into their armies and, uh, and to make war. But this is only individuals in a position of power. I mean, right. Right. <coughs> but they matter considerably. You know, and, uh, it's well known that some, you know, when we had monarchies and things, some monarchs were a lot more aggressive than others. And Napoleon was a lot, uh, you know, and Hitler. Right? The, the 20th century would have been very different without Hitler. Not the only reason, but, but uh, it's a reason. Uh, and uh, so, but what you said was was interesting. Uh, when you have, by and large, when I talk about economic power, I, I talk, talk about very large groups of people uh, interacting and producing massive social changes, but slowly, steadily, um, not on the surface, as it were, you know, feudalism into capitalism, 400 years or whatever. Uh, whereas in, in, in war, we are talking about a bunch of individuals seeking economic resources. And so military power changes the nature of uh, uh, individual and group relations. <coughs> 